Uh, thank you, Anthony. When Anthony asks me to do something, I can't turn him down. So, uh, uh, and uh, and it's always a pleasure to be in Somerset because, of course, it all started here uh, for me. And um, actually, you know, working with Anthony all those years ago, uh, who I still describe as he was my mentor. Um, because actually we shared such a common vision, I think, in, in our thinking about exactly what he's just reflected uh, about this bringing farming and the environment together. In fact, that's how we first met, wasn't it, Anthony? Uh, I think you heard me waxing lyrical <coughs> on that very subject, and I was still at university, I think, wasn't I? Um, so, uh, and that, you know, that's why I was very pleased to come to this Water Forum. And actually, if you hear the sort of summary Anthony's just given, uh, and I'm so pleased to hear that everyone is getting together because there are so many diverse sections now working on water, um, of which I'm really aware of, whether it's quality, supply, demand, um, the houses that need water, sewage, uh, farmers that need water, everything in climate change. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, growing picture, I would say, and, um, and it's something I'm very conscious of. Uh, I, but I, I also think Somerset is a really key area, isn't it? I remember all those days years ago, don't you remember, when Somerset was one of the first areas where uh, there was this idea to pay farmers to farm for nature on the Somerset levels. And it was so controversial, wasn't it, that they were burning effigies of our friends in the Nature Conservancy Council. But, you know, look how far we've come since those days. Um, and we've gone through so much down here, and not least to mention all the flooding as well, because that's all part of the picture. Uh, and I sort of see that we're moving into now a, the next new phase uh, of what we, we can and need to do uh, in the water landscape. And obviously, I don't need to, uh, to tell everyone in this room how critical water is to us. You know, it is the stuff of life. Uh, alongside soil, which is another of my other great passions, you know, soil is, uh, water is absolutely critical and getting this right uh, is critical and it touches every single one of our lives. And uh, I've made uh, uh, water, I'm the water minister is one of my titles, I'm also the nature recovery minister and the marine minister and the flooding minister, and, but water I've actually really prioritised uh, in my role. Um, I think more so than ever before because I could see that we needed to pull all these different sections together because even at government level they were quite often working quite separately the supply side and the quality side I think that's just exactly probably what you're you're facing here too um, and so that's something I've really focused on and obviously as a result of that government is um, focusing on um, water very much so and you know with the focus being that we have to have a sustainable and reliable supply of water uh, but we also have to defend the nation from uh, floods and we've got this extreme weather situation and climate change and you know there's no de denying that that brings with it lots of challenges and, and, and not least trying to keep water in the right places you know and channel it in the right places uh, so, uh, I, so I'm going to touch on a whole raft of areas that we're dealing with and hopefully that will sort of feed in some of the things you're all going to go on to discuss today. Uh, and uh, you know, two, two key areas in terms of quality uh, that, that we're very involved in at government level uh, is of course um, what the water companies do in tackling them and also of course agriculture. And on the farming side, uh, we're very much, we've actually just doubled our budget for catchment sensitive farming up to 30 million with the view that all farmers in England will get um, access to free advice once this is fully rolled out because we realise how absolutely critical, the more I go out and about, you know, the more I realise that it's actually somebody walking down your farm track that probably has the most influence of what a farmer might, might do or enter into. So that's really important. And through our new schemes, uh, the the uh, environmental uh, land management schemes, there's going to be lots of focus on um, issues that link into water and flood control, uh, whether it's soil management, and that's in the first um, sustainable farming initiative standard, so soil management, you know, farmers will be paid to manage their soil to, to keep it healthy and sustainable, but in doing so, of course, that'll have big benefits for water, in holding water, <coughs> controlling water, even cleaning water. Uh, and then and then there'll also be focus on things like uh, river corridors, uh, you know, river buffering, 
in the right place, obviously. And, and that's already, there were already options for farmers to get funding for that through our Woodland Creation Grants. So that's something we particularly focus on. It'll help us plant more trees, but it, it will also help with this water issue as well. But we also know that there are really challenging uh, issues around uh, uh, nutrients, uh, nitrates, phosphates, they don't need to tell people in Somerset uh, about that because we're one of the key areas facing this issue where our uh, wonderful world leading protected landscapes on the Somerset levels are desperately degraded, the flora has completely changed and that is because of the, the high nutrients in the water. Uh, and uh, and largely here it's phosphate, but uh, you know nitrates are also related to this. So um, we, we're working with farmers and water companies to tackle this. And I'm sure discussion will come out about this later in the day. But we've got a whole package uh, coming through on that that we help will unlock this planning, uh, hold up on planning uh, that's going on. Uh, but we've also. Uh, committed extra resources to more farm inspectors for the EA. I think we've got EA representatives here today. Hello, yes. Um, and they're already out and about, aren't they? And they're being targeted in these key catchments uh, to go out and talk to farmers. So they've got sort of two roles. It's to make sure that the regulation is adhered to, and we've recently tweaked the farming rules for water, and also to enforce. I mean, we, we have to do enforcement. And um, but, it, but really, we want to go along the advice role uh, more than anything else, rather than um, whack everyone with a big hammer. Uh, but of course, we are tackling water companies. Um, I just wanted to mention the, the River Axe Grant Scheme, uh, which lots of you will probably know about, which I think was a really good example of um, how the uh, enforcement proceeds can pay for local environmental projects. And uh, the catchment, the Somerset Catchment Partnership was a beneficiary of the, uh, an in, it's called an enforcement undertaking donation uh, resulting from a sewage relating in, related incident in the Axe in 2017 and as part of the mitigation package um, it, it was accepted by the Environment Agency that Wessex Water would provide a donation to the Somerset Catchment Partnership and uh, so 20, 25,000 pounds of that donation is available I think that's still open till the end of this month for people who want to apply up to maximum £5,000 um, to that fund. So if that's of interest, do you have a look at it? Uh, and of course, this tackling the water quality end of it is, is really important for the, the flora, the fauna and the environment. Uh, but of course, if we get this right, it's, it's going to also help us tackle sustainable development so that uh, local authorities uh, will be able to flag through planning commissions. But they'll also be very aware that we have to build houses in the right place for the future and actually I'm working very very closely at government level with the housing minister uh, on um, on this whole nutrient issue uh, and, and you know and trust me I have to do a lot of persuading uh, of them you know on the environment uh, so we have to work together to come up with you know our outcomes uh, and water um, companies as I mentioned, what have got to play their part. You'll have heard a lot about them recently. I think we, I think we've got some colleagues from Wessex Water here today. Hello, nice to see you. Um, and um, through the Environment Act, which I was very proud to have steered through Parliament, took two years. It's an enormous piece of legislation. It's actually the biggest piece of legislation to go through our government in two decades, uh, and it will. It will, it will change the dial on sustainable living. There's just so much in it that we need and that, uh, and that we want, uh, and, it, and it, it's all coming through in the measures in the Act. And through that, um, where it's, well, A, we've got a legally binding target to restore nature by 2030, and given I'm the Nature Recovery Minister, that is no mean feat, given it's going like this at the moment. You know, so we've got to turn that around. I think everyone agrees that we can't live healthily unless we've got a healthy world around us. So, but through the Environment Act, we're, that's one of the big legal targets. But uh, there are lots and lots of other targets, and there are a whole range of targets on water. So one of them is uh, these are the proposals we're consulting now on this. Uh, so you can go and have a look at that. You can feed into it. Um, and we're getting a massive response, as you can imagine, to our proposals, which are all absolutely backed up by science and evidence. But if people come to us with better evidence and a different view, you know, obviously we'll look at that. 
Um, and one of the uh, targets is to reduce phosphorus loadings from wastewater by 80%. And we've got um, uh, another proposed target, which is to reduce nitrate phosphate and sediments. So that's basically soil runoff um, by at least 40% by 2030. So all of these things will affect this, this area here uh, when they come through. So, and I've been very, very clear to our friends in the water companies that um, we have to have, they must do better on sewage discharges. You know, I feel like I've been overwhelmed by sewage for the last year. Um, but, you know, we've got to cut the use of these storm sewage overflows that everyone now knows about and that the, the current approach that's been going on, potentially under the radar, of using these facilities too often or relying on them when actually they were only ever supposed to be for emergency use when we had extreme weather and to stop basically sewage backing up in our loos. That's what they're really there for when the storm water goes down the pipe and then the, the sewage goes down the pipe too. So, uh, but you know, we're on the case in terms of that and um, aside from everything in the Environment Act, which is, says by law now that we have to reduce harm from these storm sewage overflows, uh, there's also a massive investigation underway by the EA as well, uh, looking at you know, are the permits being used cor correctly and so forth. And we as government are going to um, come out with our storm overflow reduction plan uh, by the autumn. We've consulted on that. That's close. We've had thousands of responses to that. Uh, and it's, uh, but, but what we will put in place and the new law will fundamentally change the way that industry monitors uh, their use of these uh, facilities uh, and uses them. And so it, this will be the largest change, I believe, to our sewage infrastructure in, in our history, really, probably since the whole lot was built. Uh, and, um, and whilst a lot of that's going to be sort of hidden away underground, it will make a very big difference to our environment. We've actually got six pages in the Environment Act of clauses dealing with um, this issue and sewage. And that also includes all water companies having to come up with drainage and sewage management plans which I was quite surprised when I went into the department to discover that they have a plan for what comes out of the tap, but not what went down the loo, you know? And so we're gonna link all these things together, um, rightly so. And um, I think you'll have heard of the enormous fine that Southern Water got, a 90 million pound fine uh, recently. So it does show that, you know, action will be taken uh, if, if the correct procedures aren't being followed and people always ask me about what about their massive salaries and which are much bigger than the DEFRA ministers. Um, you know, that's on the on the table now. There are much uh, clearer rules and regulations about transparency, who gets paid what and on what that's based, you know. So you can't be, you know, polluting your water and then paying yourself a soft and great salary. Apologies to our Wessex water guy, he's probably gonna come back and defend them. But you know, it, you know, it's all, it's all much more transparent now and that's that's absolutely correct through the regulator, of course. Um, but it's not just our rivers uh, where we'll be delivering a lot of change um, for the better. We're also investing in um, the habitats that depend on water, because as I said, you know, the habitats, A, we've got to restore them, but B, if we do restore them, they can help us uh, tackle the water issues. So we've committed £16 million to peatland restoration, and that's coming out of our Nature for Climate change funds, then that's directed to tree planting and peatland restoration. And um, as you'll know, our, our peatlands, and we've got you know fantastic examples on sunset levels, they're huge uh, carbon stores. So uh, by um, stopping them being excavated and emitting carbon, that helps climate change, but also by restoring them and re-wetting them, they then hold the carbon. So they're great sequesterers of carbon. And I was really pleased that the, um, the Somerset Peatland Partnership, we've probably got people here involved in that, uh, successfully bid for £300,000 recently to enable them to establish a large-scale restoration project, bringing together lots of partners, the Somerset Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, the Hawke and Owl Trust, um, Avon Wildlife Trust. And it's partnerships like these across our, our whole natural environment space 
uh, that, that are going to be absolutely vital. Um, Anthony mentioned the, um, the Somerset Water Partnership, didn't you, earlier, um, which uh, I think was superseded by the SRA. It's, you know, this sort of track of how all these organisations run is a little bit complicated, isn't it, to get your head around. But, um, but I do think that today, uh, you know, I hope you will come out of it all realising how important partnerships will be in the future. And for all of our wider water goals, because they can help us uh, with nature-based solutions, whether it's wetlands, whether it's mitigating for nutrients, whether it's helping clean up water, slowing the flow, tackling climate change, working with farmers, giving farmers opportunities, and indeed um, opportunities in the local economy. Uh, and recently, we, um, the Somerset Wetlands Nature Recovery Project um, uh, has got off the ground, and that's one of six um, funded by government and so far, Natural England has invested half a million pounds in this um, partnership, and that will help restore huge areas of the of the levels and bring loads of partners <coughs> together, uh, not just the ENGOs, but lots of the farmers around them, uh, in terms of getting into the new schemes government's offering to farm in the way that will interlink uh, with these big areas. And uh, I actually think that's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, and I've got to just touch a bit on flooding because that is so critical. You know, we live with flooding in this area, uh, and it's been pretty stark, hasn't it? I remember the uh, it was 2013-14, wasn't it? The the last huge tranche of uh, terrible flooding um, down here, and you know the effect on communities and people and businesses is really stark. Uh, and as the floods minister, I go around the country to lots of other areas. Uh, that have been subjected to flooding, and they, they usually wheel me out with my wellies to... Um, but, you know, it is actually good to see the stuff on the ground because every area is different in terms of what, what causes the flooding and what the solutions are. And we actually set up, um, two years ago, the Flood and Coastal Erosion Policy, and this was the biggest update that we've done in a decade on how to tackle flooding. And it set out 40 actions, 40 different things... Uh, that, that we needed to do to build a nation more resilient to flooding and that included obviously the big investment in flood infrastructure but also managing water better, harnessing you know, natural solutions uh, but also preparing people so that they understand that they are in a flood risk area. That's one of the critical things and learning how to live with it and what mitigations could be made. And we've actually upped our flood funding in government from 2.6 billion, which was um, the, from two, 2015 uh, until uh, last year. We're now into the next, and that was to best protect 314,000 homes. But in our new um, fund, it's 5.2 billion. So it's a huge um, uh, chunk of funding, and that's to deliver 2,000 more flood street schemes and protect. 330,000 more properties. And the Somerset will get real benefits from this. Uh, the capital programme for the Wessex area is being tripled, and in our county, uh, the EA will lead on 17 projects worth over 132 million, and local councils will get uh, 22 million more. And it will include the long awaited Bridgewater Barrage. Uh, and that's a hundred million pound scheme, and that's due to start, I believe I'm right, but our EA friends are correct, in 2023, uh, ish, yes, it is, 2023, with a, with, a, with a view to it being completed by 2025. Um, and, it, and that won't just help to tackle flooding, but of course it unlocks uh, parts of Bridgewater for growth and for jobs, and you know people feel more safe and more secure, and all of those issues come into play and I've seen that around the country how this money uh, works uh, for lots of other benefits um, and but of course there it won't all be about hard infrastructure I think this was the sort of key of our new our new policy is that there'll be lots of other ways we have to tackle flooding and that's where um, nature-based solutions in particular come in uh, particularly where you're talking about things of tackling rising sea level. You know, we, we simply cannot build hard concrete walls all around the coast. So we, we'll do them whether it's right to do it and all the uh, modelling sh shows that that's the right thing to do. But equally, we will adopt other measures like they have at Steart Marshes. And a, a very good example of that is your um, Hills to Levels project. Uh, 
which um, was uh, actually instigated, I think, by the Somerset Rivers Authority, wasn't it, originally? And that's brought together lots of partners, and um, it's led by Ben, I think Ben's here, is he? Um, no, is he not, from the, um, from the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. Uh, and, um, you know, that enabled a lot of natural flood management interventions and slowing the flow of water higher up in the catchment. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, we're seeing all over the country now and it's going to get, get bigger. Uh, and um, just a couple of other things on in Somerset. The, uh, the SRA and the EEA are now increasing the capacity of the River Surrey and the King's Sedgemoor drain, so that will enable the Paris and the Tone levels to drop faster, allowing the pumps to switch on sooner, uh, and whilst delivering habitat, better habitat and biodiversity. And there are other projects uh, on stream to ma maintain and uh, update pumps and so forth. But, um, but as I said, the whole intention is for a much more holistic approach to what we do. I'm actually working uh, on what I'm calling a holistic plan for water in government. And it will bring together all of these different sides and factions, whether it is water supply, because we are, believe it or not, going to face a water shortage in this country by 2050. Uh, and that's why we've got a massive stream of work going on, A, on huge infrastructure projects like the ginormous pipe that's taking water from the Humber estuary right down the east coast uh, to Essex. Uh, that's an Anglian water project, and we're going to have to transport a fur water from the Severn across the east. There's lots and lots of work going on that, and we need it. But as well as that, we've got to do things like we are working on reducing our own individual consumption of water, uh, and that's where this sort of will feed into all the houses where we're building, you know, better water efficiency. So we're consulting on that and efficiency labelling and all of those things. Um, and also then tackling pollution and all of this water pollution side that I touched on before, nature and biodiversity, flood control, um, climate change, adaptation. Uh, but also I think a lot of this will bring opportunity. So I'm ever the optimist. Uh, otherwise I don't think I'll be doing this job. Uh, and I think that's really why what you're doing today, I hope is going to be really useful because I think I'm touching on all the things I think you'll be, you'll be talking about. Uh, and um, and the bringing together of all those different partners. You know, you've you've got the EA, you've got Natural England, you've got farmers, you've got the different bodies you've already got. You've got the SLRA, drainage boards, and so forth. Um, and and so if you all work together uh, on what we're going to do in the future, I think uh, th there'll be very exciting opportunities, and we will be able to have the sustainable development we need because that's really important too. People want to live somewhere and want to house them. Who wouldn't want to live in lovely, lovely Somerset? And uh, but we'll also be able to look after our water environment. So I think I'll leave it there, actually. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Has anybody got a, any quick questions? No. Glad you asked me about that. That's one of my another of my favourite subjects, sustainable urban drainage, which I banged on about as a backbencher. Yes, so it's very interesting. So in that act, which is 2010, uh, we could already have made sustainable urban drainage and development mandatory, but it was never switched on. So we in Defra are pushing incredibly hard with our friends in Duluc to get this. Uh, as mandatory. We don't need new legislation for it. So what we're doing right now is conducting a review on how it will all work uh, because it's not quite as straightforward as people think because you've got to consider all the things that if there's any developers in the room they'll already know all this, you know, and councils, 
who is responsible for the sustainable urban drainage uh, after it's been built and years later and who manages it and who maintains it and where does it link into the system and or should water companies take them over you know all of those things but we're we're getting on very well with the review uh, and we'll be we'll have um, hopefully be feeding back shortly as we say for the Taiwanese government but that will be shortly uh, because we're uh, we're really hopeful that this will come into operation because wherever I go it's raised by everybody all the time so thank you Okay, thanks, and yeah, so um, Ewan Jones, I'm chair of Princeton Town Council uh, on the other side of the county. Uh, one of the other things I do is I'm a director of the Forest of Selwood Community Interest Company, which is the source of four rivers, including the Brew and the Froom. Uh, we have a countryside stewardship partnership covering some 4,000 hectares, so it's one of the biggest in the country. Mm. I uh, wondered if you could expand on the recent announcements about landscape to scale recovery because we've been working towards landscape to scale recovery in the Forest of Selwood. Obviously, there's opportunities on the levels as well, so we're, we're very much the hills. Uh, could you expand on the recent announcements and what the future for landscape to scale recovery is? Yes, no, well, there haven't really been any change recent announcements. There's an awful lot of spurious stuff that went out in the press the weekend, which is all completely wrong. So where they got that from, I have no idea. Uh, yes, there is always the intention that through the um, Elms Environmental Land Management Scheme, obviously there'll be the issues that where we want to get you know, all farmers, hopefully, to get involved in doing something for the environment and get the payments for it. Uh, so I referred like like soil and uh, buffers and um, things like that and integrated pest management. But uh, And then there's a landscape nature middle bu bar of it and then there's a large scale landscape recovery section to it so um, and that is to get much much bigger landscape schemes off the ground uh, in partnerships linking up people and we've just um, the the first round has just closed you probably know about this uh, we had really brilliant response uh, applications to that and, f and initially 15 um, will go forward as pilots so we haven't announced which ones they are yet, going through them. And they're not all, uh, people think they're just all uh, environmental NGOs and so forth who do great work. But there are also some really good farming partnerships that have applied uh, to that and catchment catchment partnerships, um, particularly the catch, I, I, I think I'm not sure I mentioned it in my speech, but I do want to believe the future will be working in catchments in particular. That's why what you're talking about today is so important. So you'll hear more later that because a second round will open. So that's still an intention to, because uh, that will de deliver a lot of uh, nature. Um, and the, one of the critical things is to link the nature up, which is why you, like your Selwood scheme is, uh, would be so valuable. Guy Thompson, Wessex Water and Aid. Yeah, completely applaud everything you said. Um, the holistic approach to nature recovery, the need and the opportunity for water industry to raise its game on environmental leadership is why I'm here. Um, I'm really interested, therefore, in what the Environment Act architecture can do to drive that and integrate as quickly as possible. So, my question goes really to your point about the Environment Act target for water quality. In that context, in, in the context of what you just said, the need to work on a catchment scale. Is an environment act target that specifies the requirement for phosphorus reduction from sewage treatment works such a sensible uh, idea? Is, it, is that not too prescriptive, given the opportunity to get water industry regulated investment directed at the most efficient solutions, be that asset upgrades or working with our farmers and our, uh, our communities and our catchments? Well, it's not just aimed at the wastewater one is aimed at sewage treatment works, as you know. And as you all know, sewage, sewage treatment works do need to do this. Uh, in fact, a lot of people would like it to be higher than that, wouldn't they? Yeah. Much higher. Um, and um, but, uh, but it's not just about water. There's more efficient ways of, 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 of delivering an outcome that doesn't simply mandating asset upgrades. Well, I'm, sh I'm sure you know, of course, it isn't we're not doing it just one thing because we've got the other targets which are the 40% <coughs> reduction in nitrate phosphate and sediment well that's you know leveled at farmers farmers have got a lot of other things coming at them through different zones and you know it's not just stuff in the act uh, and they've got the the farming rules for water but you know we've also got got the housing end you know to tackle should we somehow be taking out some of these things before they ever get to a sewage treatment works? you know i think innovation and tech is going to be 
really important in this space, and that's moving very quickly. And what ha that's why policy is so important. If you can give the the, the legal indicators, you know, that, that, that then triggers the, the investment. And, and we saw that in solar panels, for example, you know, when we, we did the subsidy and everyone in, into building solar panels. So, so uh, yes, we are not just attacking the water companies. 